In front of me, we have a 1929 Model A Ford engine block. And this may very well be the oldest engine that I've ever worked on in my short career. And in fact, here's what my cleaning guy who's worked for us for nearly 40 years had to say. This is an old Model A Ford. Uh, hardly have ever seen any of these. Uh, by the time I was in this business, they were all gone. Once in a while we see one as a restoration, which is what this one here is. Now there are a lot of different sides to the engine machining world. You have the guys who are working on 3000 horsepower race engines. And then you have the guys like us who are basically doing machine work on whatever comes through the door. When you get into something like this, that's pushing a hundred years old, there are going to be things about it that make it difficult to machine and it may not always be as perfect as you want it to be, but you have to work with what you have. And that being said, we still strive to give our customers the best quality and the most dependability that we can out of what they've brought us. For instance, when we look at the deck of this block, there's a lot of corrosion. I mean, it's seen its fair share of use over the years. Like I said, we're pushing 100 years old. So we're gonna do our best to get a nice surface on this deck. We're gonna surface the head as well, with the goal being that we can get a head gasket that seals so that we can keep the water where it's supposed to be and keep the compression where it's supposed to be. The seats are also significantly worn in the block as well as being ground who knows how many times. Now, obviously there's no way to know how many times this block has been in a machine shop before, but we do know that it's been in at least one shop before. So tell me about that tag. Well, that tag was from Milts Auto Parts. That was a machine shop here in the Greeley area when I was a kid. Uh, I don't remember what year they closed up. I'm guessing somewhere around 1975. Uh, and then it eventually turned into a, a Napa store uh, machine shop. But uh, back in the day, Milts Auto Parts was the place to go. <laughs> So basically this tag is from when it was rebuilt sometime prior to 1975. Yeah, and there's a date code on there, but I can't, can't read it. I don't know what their, their yeah. code was. It just says 225. So I don't know if that was February 2nd, 1955, 65, 75, who knows? Yep. So it must have been board 80. 20 on the mains and 10 on the rods. Yeah, that sounds right. So if anybody remembers Milt's Auto Parts, why send us a comment, let us know. <laughs> now there are quite a few things on this engine that are a little bit different than what we typically see on our modern day engines. The first difference that I'm gonna point out is that rather than the typical insert bearings that we see in our modern day engines, this engine utilizes Babbitt main and rod bearings. And unfortunately, Replacing Babbitt bearings is a different process that a lot of shops don't perform today because it's just not common on today's engines. I am no expert on Babbitt bearings because we do not do the process in our shop of replacing the Babbitt bearings. But roughly the idea of what they do is they pour the Babbitt material into kind of the main bore of the block. And at that point, once the bearing has essentially cooled, it's almost like it's cast in place. Then they come back in and they machine it for the proper dimensions of the crankshaft. Same thing with the connecting rod. They pour the Babbitt into both halves of the connecting rod and then consequently machine the bearing essentially. Whereas on our insert bearings, the dimensions of the bearing is already machined and they're simply inserted into the housing bore of the rod or the housing bore of the block. Since that is a process that we don't have the capabilities or the knowledge to perform in our shop, our plan here is to just be very careful with all of the rods and obviously the block here so that we don't damage any of the Babbitt bearings here. With that in mind, they'll be reused, which obviously we would much rather be able to have perfect brand new bearings, but it's always a balance of cost and how much of a hassle you wanna go because in this case, we would be forced to ship this block out 
and it's just not what our customer is looking for. Since I really don't know a lot about the Babbit pour process, I'm going to include a link in the description to a video from actually Haggerty, who has done a video on a Model A where they actually had the mains and the rods poured again. So if you wanna check that out, again, I'm not getting paid or anything to link that. I just found it when I was kind of researching for my video and I thought you guys might enjoy seeing that. Years have gone by since this block was last bored, but that being said, the cylinder walls are actually in pretty good condition. There doesn't seem to be a lot of wear. However, the pistons are scored pretty badly. So the customer will need to get new pistons, but we're not gonna go to an oversize on the cylinders. We're just gonna touch them up in the hone. And by doing that touch up in the hone with some new pistons and new rings, we'll have a good sealing surface for the rings to seat and everything should be good in that department. I'm sure you've also noticed by this point that this engine does feature a flathead design, meaning that the valves are actually in the engine block. And let me go grab the head. The cylinder head, as the name suggests, is flat with the combustion chamber here in the head and no valves or valve train in the cylinder head. Now what you'll notice here about the valve seats, which was fairly common up until the point that we moved to unleaded fuels, is the valve seats are simply machined into the cast iron of the block. And what that means is they're fairly soft and they won't stand up to the unleaded fuels that we have today. So what we typically do is install valve seat inserts. Even if we weren't worried about the fuels today, we would likely be installing valve seat inserts in these due to the wear and due to the fact that they've probably been ground so many times over the years. And as such, the valves are sitting quite a bit lower in the head than they're really meant to. Now there is one seat here that actually does appear to have a seat insert, but again, it appears to be a soft cast iron insert. And as you can see, it's quite a bit of corrosion on it. So we're gonna be replacing all of the valve seats in this head and remachining them. Flathead engine designs really were not all that uncommon all the way up into the 50s and I think some maybe even into the 60s. But what surprised me about this engine is the design of the valve and the valve guides. I just know that some of the old school guys are gonna make fun of me for saying that I've never seen this, but I personally had never seen a valve guide design that was actually in two pieces. So this is the assembly for one valve guide and you can see how it's split right down the middle there and the valve, instead of being, you know, like this John Deere valve, the same diameter all the way up the valve stem with our keeper grooves there, the valve actually mushrooms out on the tip. And this is by design, you know, it's not like, it's not like it wore to that. It was designed this way. Maybe there'll be somebody in the comments who can offer a little bit more insight to this because I'm not sure if they were just after more surface area there on the tip of the valve for wear, or if it was designed for possibly even ease of assembly, or maybe even ease of, you know, serviceability basically. But essentially what you do here is you put the valve in, then you take your valve guide here and take the two pieces and they go right there around the valve and that slides up into the bore of the block, which I know you guys probably can't see that at this point. I'll get a better view of it in a minute. Then you have your valve spring here and the guide pushes up. The valve spring is what's holding the guide up into the bottom of the block. Because again, as you can see, you have your two pieces here. It's got this flange on it and that goes up into the bore of the block around the valve, just like that. Essentially that spring is holding the valve guide in place in the block. But the thing is that would give kind of a ease of assembly and it would give ease of serviceability because when your valve guide wears out, it's just a slip fit in the block. So you can drop these two pieces out, put a new valve guide in and get it reassembled and get, you know, get moving down the road. The retainer is a little bit different as well, as opposed to our normal two piece keepers that go in the keeper groove right here with a retainer that comes up over them. You basically have this little guy here and 
you actually need kind of a special tool here to compress the valve so that you can get the retainer put in place. So we actually have one of those tools. This ring compressor. This ring groove cleaner. This calipers. This valve seat cutters. And blue chalk. And anyway, I drew a picture on there when I was a little kid. Did you get in trouble? I don't know. So here we have my grandpa's old KD valve spring compressor, specifically made for, you know, flathead engines, basically. This is a KD manufacturing out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, number 600 adjustable jaw. So you can adjust these out for different diameter springs. It has here a patent date, 210 of 20, and another patent date of 710 of 23. And when I looked up the patents on these, basically the first patent was for the tool, and the second patent was for the, the ratcheting mechanism here, so that as you squeeze it down and compress the spring, it locks in place, which obviously would be a whole lot better than trying to hold that and hold the tension of the spring while installing the retainer. And when I was doing some looking, they actually made a model that was specific to the Model A, um, but my grandpa didn't have that one. My dad said that back in the day, he was actually a Chrysler guy, which is funny because now we're Chevy guys, so <laughs> go figure. Essentially what we'll do here is get that pushed in under. There we go. So now it's under the valve spring and we'll compress that there. And now we'll take our little keeper well, not keeper, our little valve spring retainer. That slides in place like that. There we go. So now we have our valve installed. Pretty interesting the way things were done and what Ford's idea was, you know, clear back in the day, almost a hundred years ago. And all of the tooling that we use to cut valve seats is guided by a valve guide pilot. Basically that goes down inside the guide, your tooling rides on top of this pilot. So the pilot actually spins in the guide, so there has to be a little bit of clearance, but the more clearance you have, the sloppier your machine work gets. So these two-piece valve guides actually kind of induce a problem for me as far as getting a quality valve seat cut. I'm really not excited about doing the machining with that much play in the pilot. It's just not going to be fun, and I don't think I would produce a quality seat. And I know what you're saying. Oh, it's a, you know, it's a 1929 Model A. It ran fine before. It's only got like four to one compression. It'll be fine. And I agree it would probably be fine, but my goal, as always, is to do the best quality work that I can. And when I have a machine that I know can cut really nice seats with the right pilot, it's kind of what I, you know, prefer to do. So rather than setting up my tooling with a pilot that should be the correct size for the valve guides when they're installed in the block and trying to machine a nice concentric, properly aligned seat with that much slop in my valve guide, we decided that there might be a compromise. Without the valve guide installed in the block, these bores actually measure about 595. So I have zero set as 590 thousandths and we're roughly 595, 596 there on the end. So the first thing we're gonna do is look for a Surti compatible pilot that is the correct diameter to fit the parent bore of the block here nicely. And that way we can do all of our valve seat cutting with a nice fitting pilot and know that we're gonna be at least concentric to the outside diameter of that guide. That'll give us the best chance of cutting a nice seat. If it turns out that we have to order that pilot as a custom pilot, that may increase the cost significantly. So one other option we thought of was basically fitting a bushing on one of our current pilots that would fit the block nicely and therefore would save us a little bit of money, but still get us nice and concentric and rigid to cut our seats. Obviously, when we get to the point of actually doing the work on this block, 
I'm gonna be showing you guys the entire process so you'll get to see what we end up deciding to do. Every single week, we kind of get something different. We get such a wide range of engines in here. We've got that Jaguar that we're working on right now. I've got a John Deere head set up on the Surty right now that I need to get cutting after I finish up this little video here. And then we get, you know, a 1929 Model A Ford. It's kind of fun and, you know, this engine intrigues me because it's different than anything that I've ever seen. So I thought that you guys might enjoy seeing it as well. By the way, I am heading out to the SEMA show later this week. So if you guys are going to the show, if you happen to see me, definitely stop me and say hi. I'd love to see some of you guys. I've got some new stickers that I'll probably be handing out. As soon as I get back from the show, I'm gonna be jumping back into the Jaguar block that we've been working on and trying to get that job wrapped up because we finally have our pistons in. So there's really no excuses now as far as getting the block decked and the cylinders bored and honed so that we can get that job finished. So I thought it'd be fun to give you guys a little bit of a different video this week and kind of update you on where the channel is headed for the next few weeks here. Be sure to like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next one.